do not bypass your suffering. As difficult as it is to say and to even hear, do not bypass your suffering. Face it with humility and with a faith asking God to be gracious to reveal both His presence because you're needed and His purpose in your pain as it evolves. We are continuing on in our series Genesis, and so I'm going to do our scripture reading for us. This is the final sermon in our series, and we started this last year, March, and so we are, we are excited. We're thankful for what the Lord has done through this series, and we're excited about what He's going to share with us today. And so if you have your Bibles or smartphones, would you join me in Genesis chapter 50, verse 15? If not, you can follow along on the screen. Genesis 50, verse 15, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now... Please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. So Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So Joseph remained in Egypt, he and his father's house. Joseph lived 110 years. And Joseph saw Ephraim's children of the third generation. The children also of Maker, the son of Manasseh, were counted as Joseph's own. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Won't you join me as I pray? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that even in the final chapters of the book of Genesis, you are teaching us something about Jesus, revealing your wondrous grace to us as a people. And so I do ask and pray that you would help our hearts to be receptive today to your word. Equip Buddy, give him peace and calm as he proclaims your word faithfully this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Stu, for praying for us. Good morning to you. Now, it is said that South Africa possesses a superpower, a superpower. Now, I could describe it to you this morning, but it would be much more fun us actually enjoying it together. And so, take a look at this for a moment. That's it. If the penalty obviously didn't happen, you guys would have played on and we would have been all happy. I cannot stop, you can still see. 
And the commentators are as hilarious as it sounds. So I don't speak easy culture, but I had actually a friend uh, try to go, translate it for us. And apparently you can already translate course, uh, into English, but like, I will try for you. And so uh, one of the commentators asked uh, uh, the other, saying, yeah, what lodge uh, shedding stage it was? And he said, it is stage minus one. That's how bad things are gone. And, and then he goes on joking and saying that uh, uh, yet the referee is adamant that he saw the penalty and even the generator is complaining at the referee's decision. <laughs> And then he goes on to explain and elaborate and say, oh, the referee must have eaten his carrots this morning, hence the clear vision that he has to know that it was a penalty. And so when you just think about it for a moment, it is precisely that our resilience as a people, as a nation, a nation that actually sees a silver lining even in some of the darkest of clouds, which is a superpower. As, an, as a nation, that is our superpower as a nation. We can turn even load shedding into a comedic spectacle. That's another superpower we have as a people. Now, perhaps this morning you have also perhaps exercised that superpower before, right? You know, that one time when you were supposed to host that dinner to remember and you burnt the roast, right? But... Somehow, by the end of the evening, all of your guests were complimenting you for an exquisite evening of so much fun and great entertainment and also a great food, especially the chicken roast. And only you know that it wasn't chicken, right? <laughs> Stephanie and I have experienced uh, or practiced or put into play that superpower before on a romantic getaway in the Waterbury region at a national park over there for a 10-year anniversary. And so the place sells you a glamorous night under the African sky and star, stars, really getting nice and intimate with Mother, and, uh, mother Nature, with all the creatures, up a treehouse, believe it or not. And so we decided, I, you know, how often, you know, do you get to celebrate your 10-year anniversary, right? And so we decided we will do, uh, we will do it. And so you drive out in the middle of nowhere in that, in, that, uh, in that park for about an hour, but then once we got there, both the accommodation and the view were truly exquisite. It was a picture perfect, uh, right? Now, the food that they pack for you, the snacks and the drinks are also top class. And so we were living it up, really living it up until evening came. Until evening came. It turns out uh, right, that being, being in the middle of nowhere, in pitch darkness, up a tree, <laughs> is not as, uh, as exciting as you may actually think it to be, uh, uh, to be right? That especially with the big five roaming all about you, you know, uh, all around you in pitch darkness. Now, they leave you with a radio to call in case you get into trouble, but I kept on thinking, by the time they get here, what would be left of you, right? And yet that wasn't even the most, uh, the worst of it all, right? Because I, uh, is at some point in the evening, the most severe windstorm I've ever experienced came upon us that evening. In fact, it was so bad that at some point it blew the covers off a bed that Stephanie are now trying to reach and trying to keep it from flying away. That's how bad it really got. And so we found ourselves at some point cold to the bone, you know, afraid, and we were underneath, shivering underneath the, 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 the covers and thinking to ourselves, should we just radio, <laughs> you know, and call it, uh, call it a night because this is quite clearly not what we bought into but I got thinking in a moment. There you were in all alone, in the dark, and lying next to you is your beautiful wife, both thinking that this could be a lost night <laughs> alive. Let me just say, right, that that's a, about as PG as it got for the rest of the evening. 
happy 10th anniversary to us. <laughs> they were made a must of that time. And so when you just think about it, right, if you think about our context, living here in South Africa, in South, Africa uh, uh, South Africa, as a nation, as a people, we are really well adept, right, at making any and every mess or disaster from the occasional, you know, a seasonal potholes to presidential, you know, crises. We just know, have a knack through our resilience with lots of humor and, and, and also carefree spirit, are able to actually salvage, right, even the most unlikely situations. Maybe on a more serious note, when we think about the story, the history of our nation, we've seen our fair share of troubles, right? Disasters as a people, from apartheid to state ca- uh, capture, from the con- uh, consistent, persistent political unrest and, and uh, social inequalities that we have today, uh, today. And yet, through it all, we still find and look for ways to, make a sil- to find a silver lining in those dark clouds, right? That's who we are as a people. Maybe personally, this morning, you are actually undergoing some difficult times at the moment. And so whether it is a health crisis or some financial trouble, uh, trouble you're in or a broken relationship or maybe a mistake you've made that has left your life shattered, shattered. And so more than just a silver lining, you're looking for divine intervention in your situation. Divine intervention. That God will do something through it all. Listen, the spot, no matter how unlikely, painful, challenging, and even difficult are the circumstances we may find ourselves in or that you may find yourself in. The grace of God is able to find you there. The grace of God is able to find you there, turning your failures into fertilizer for growth, your mistakes into unexpected opportunities, and redeem sin. That's what the grace of God is able to do. We're ending this series this morning that we've been in, in the book of Genesis. And yet throughout the whole series, we've endeavored, sought to actually expose to you how the goodness of God's grace is able to meet both people and places that we would least likely expect, able to meet us there. And the book of Genesis ends in Genesis 50, verses 15 to 26, in one of the most painful and confusing circumstance or place that we would least expect to find the grace of God. Evil and suffering. Evil and suffering. And so jump with me into the text, verse, uh, chapter 50, verse 16, uh, sorry, verse 15. We read this. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Now, this verse reveals the suffocating grip of a guilt-ridden conscience. The suffocating grip of a guilt-ridden conscience for the evil that they are referring to in that text took place almost 40 years ago. 40 years ago. And yet his brothers, even although 40 years had elapsed, they're still living, terrified of Joseph's retribution towards them. And so their anxiety actually exposes two realities here for us. The first one is this, that uh, the, um, uh, the burden of unrelinquished guilt. The burden of unrelinquished guilt. And so guilt unresolved in your life will haunt you, will haunt you for years and even decade, uh, decades, leading you to misinterpret, yeah, uh, misinterpret cross relationships or your self-perception and, and ultimately will, lead, uh, will deter you from ever being able to uh, envision, envision forgiveness in the hands of others or even yourself. And so the burden of unrelinquished guilt. Second, the devious nature of self-condemnation. Because in effect, Joseph's brother's uh, response towards him, their fear towards Joseph, was not a mirror or did not represent Joseph's character, but actually mirrored back to them their own. It mirrored back to them their own. For we read at the end of verse 17, Joseph, uh, uh, Joseph was brought to tears at the thought that they expected that he would do them harm. 
that he would do them harm out of vindictiveness. The very last possible thing Joseph harbored in his heart towards him. And so then what are we seeing? We're seeing that the brothers misjudged Joseph. Why? Why did they misjudge Joseph? Why were they afraid that Joseph will, 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 uh, will act in vindictiveness towards him? Because that's what they themselves would have done. That's why. That's why. Because in their broken, uh, uh, brokenness, and, uh, uh, brokenness and the evil that they have perp- uh, perpetrated, they, they could not forgive themselves. And what is that? Self-condemnation. And so therefore they thought that Joseph couldn't forgive their mother. That's what they were projecting onto Joseph. Now sadly, the same kind of misjudgment we equally project onto God as well. That in some of the sins that we may find ourselves guilty of, we believe them to be unforgivable. And so we start to think that God views us much in the same ways as we view ourselves. That he will view us much in the same way as we view ourselves. And so if I view myself or consider myself as damned because of what I've done, I think that God shares in the same self-condemning attitudes or views of my own soul. And so then Joseph's response in verse 19 helps us to shatter the mindset of a guilt-ridden conscience. Look at what he goes on to say to his brothers. Do not fear. For am I in the place of God? For am I in the place of God? Is what Joseph is asking them. And so Joseph is reminding them, and by extension reminding us, that both condemnation and redemption are God's sole prerogative. Both condemnation and redemption are God's sole prerogative. Only God stands in the place to both condemn or redeem. And so, meaning that, friend, you cannot, you cannot irrefutably condemn yourself any more than you can eternally redeem yourself. You just cannot. You cannot. And so, therefore, what we are seeing, we're seeing this uh, first point, that God alone can extend freedom from condemnation through His liberating grace. God alone is the one who can extend freedom from condemnation through His liberating grace. And so, friend, if you're here this morning, do you struggle with guilt over the things that you have done onto others or on yourself? Do you struggle with guilt, carry guilt with you? Do you think that God views you as damned and will just as damned as you view yourself? Listen, this text will urge you, will urge you to stop. You cannot dictate who God will have or will not have mercy upon. You cannot. Only God can. And only God can. And the fact that God extends liberating grace to Joseph's guilt-ridden and self-condemning brothers means that he can extend the same grace to you. Yours is just to simply ask, to ask him to extend that grace. Now, verse 20, at the heart of the text, verse 20 is at the heart of it. In fact, some commentators would even go so far as to say that it summarizes, it brings to conclusion the whole, the whole book of Genesis and not just simply Joseph's life. And so we read in in verse 20, Joseph going on to say, As for you, you, speaking to his brothers, meant evil against me. But God meant it for good to uh, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. He's referring to the way that God preserved the nation, uh, nations from starvation through his relief, uh, relief in the life of Joseph. That's what he's referring to. But that verse, verse 20, actually raises some fundamental questions we may have around the existence of good and evil, 
fundamental questions we may have around God's sovereignty and human freedom. Fundamental questions we may have around human responsibility in our choices. And so we must grapple with these questions faithfully. And as we seek to try to grapple with these questions faithfully, John Bloom's counsel, his teacher and, and co-founder of Desiring God, his counsel, uh, counsel is actually worth us heeding as we grapple with this. Here's what he, he went on to write. What we, find is, uh, what we find is that we simply aren't suited to bear the weight of the full knowledge of good and evil. It's knowledge too complex for us to manage. It's beyond us on both sides, on both the evil and good side. It's beyond us. And the merciful truth is that God does not ask us to bear it. He asks us to trust Him with it. He asks us to trust Him with it. And so therefore, as we look to trust God with just these realities that we're about to, to uh, delve into, we must make our peace. We must make our peace with three complex realities. Let's start with number one. God comfortably maneuvers the parallel tracks on which good and evil causes to accomplish his purposes. I'll say that again. God comfortably maneuvers the parallel tracks on which good and evil coexist to accomplish his purposes. In fact, in some way, that's what Genesis has been about since chapter 3. Because since the fall, what do we see in every episode? Uh, uh, every episode it is this, that despite good and evil operating side by side, God's grace is able to bring about His purposes. That's what we see in the book of Genesis. Now, our struggles with the coexistence of good and evil often leads us to have to wonder, right? How can a good God allow for evil to exist? Perhaps because when we're confronted with evil, the pain and the suffering that it brings, that it inflicts, can sometimes prove to be unbearable, right? We're overwhelmed by it, beyond our powers to be able to mitigate against it. And so we often find ourselves powerless in the face of evil. And so then, here again, we may project that powerlessness against the face of evil onto God. Onto God, forgetting that our God is not constrained by the dichotomy, that is the contrasting realities, uh, realities between good and evil. He's not constrained by it. In fact, our God, God is more at home in the complex reali uh, reality or complex dichotomy between good and evil than we would think. And so God is not put out like we are at the coexistence of good and evil in the world, and even how good and evil sometimes get tangled in any circumstance at play in a fallen and broken world. He's not put out by that. Instead, God still endeavors, still endeavors to bring about His purposes. Bring about His purposes in the complexity of that dichotomy. John, uh, Bible commentator John Walton of, uh, notes that since he, that is our God, has chosen not to eradicate a fallen race, but to redeem it, he does his work in an imperfect complex. Do you get that? The fact that our God has chosen not to put an end to the world because it's broken, but chooses to work and redeem it, then God it's made his peace. It's made his peace with the complexity, complexity of a fallen and broken uh, world, uh, world that we live in. And so in other words, our God, our God is at peace. He is at peace in doing his gracious work between the parallel tracks, those parallel tracks bringing about his, uh, his purposes in the presence 
of both evil and good. That he does that. Bring, brings about his purpose in the presence of that. It's not put out by it. Which then brings us to, second, the paradox of God's sovereignty and human choice. The paradox of God's sovereignty and human choice. We have to wrestle with that. And so, God, uh, 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 and so just because the story of Joseph highlights to us that God is sovereign, remains sovereign, in control of every circumstance, does not imply that God appreciates or approves or orchestrates sinful behavior or choices and circumstances. He does not. He does not. He simply has the capacity to be able to transform evil into good. And so our God, uh, our, our God does not condone or orchestrates sinful actions, the sinful acts of humanity. He doesn't. He uh, doesn't. does not condone it. But what does he do? He weaves, weaves together every single one of our choices, however flawed they are, to bring about his great plan. And so Joseph's brothers were responsible for their treachery. Make no mistake. But God used their sin to bring about his plan. Now, when we think about, think about the sovereignty of God in a world where people are free to make sinful choices. It is a paradox. Complex paradox to try to actually navigate through. Uh, through. Because in some degree, we feel like, we may feel like wanting to ask, well, if God is still sovereign while people are making sinful choices, is then God causing or simply allowing our sinful choices? Is he causing or simply allowing them? My friends, causing or simply allowing are terms that don't fully capture God's involvement in a broken and sinful world. Don't fully capture it. For we have to try to avoid two extremes on either side. Because we do not want to simply, uh, uh, simply imply that God is somewhat, you know, powerless in the face of sinful choices. That He is somehow at the mercy of humanity's sinfulness. We don't want to imply that. That's an extremity we want to stay away from. Nor do we want to say that God then condones or orchestrates. But is part and parcel of the evil that happens in the world. We want to try to avoid that. that. We want to try to balance God's sovereignty and human freedom to choose and hold those in tension. And so in some way, in some way when we think about the paradox, uh, paradox, it's not enough to just think, is he causing or is he allowing? But perhaps it's better to rather uh, uh, say, God redeems. God transforms the evil and sinful choices that we see at play in the world. However, third, the complex interplay, that these two things are interplaying, I'm playing to you, the complex interplay between God's will and our voluntary decisions actually harmonizes, brings together in some way God's sovereignty and with human, uh, with human response, uh, culpability. So there's a complex interplay here. And so what do we mean? mean that God does not control our choices as if we're robots. He doesn't. And so what does God do? God wills. He wills that we be able to make voluntary choices while he still remains sovereign over the universe. And so he wills that you be able to make voluntary choices while he remains sovereign over the universe. And so therefore, that means that you and I are actually free 
to make choices that may not align or even contradict God's desires. We're able to do that. Make choices that may not align or even contradict God's desires under His sovereignty. And here's the thing. And because we can make such voluntary choices, then the responsibility is on us over the moral quality of those choices. So what do I mean by moral quality? I mean whether a choice you've made is either good or evil. That responsibility is you. It is up on you. Because you can make, you can make voluntary choices under the sovereignty of God. And because it is a voluntary choice, then you are culpable or you remain responsible, accountable for whether there was virtue or vice in the outcome of that action. You remain accountable for it before God. Now, a complex, you know, reality, interplay, I know, but that's how we are able to simultaneously explain God's sovereign control of every circumstance while humanity remains accountable for the outcome of their actions. Now, in summary, when we take these three complex realities together, they ought to lead us to simply marvel at the mystery of God's grace at work in a good and evil world. That's where it drives us to. That we ought to marvel, marvel at the mystery of God's grace at work in an evil and good, in a good and evil world. Marvel at that mystery. Back to verse 20. Joseph, speaking to his brothers, said, You, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, it is so striking that it is Joseph and not his brothers who make that observation. I know we could read it and not think twice about it, but it is such a striking observation to make that it is Joseph who says this, not his brothers. Because think about it the other way. Had his brothers been the one who acclaimed, well, Joseph, what we meant for evil in your life God has clearly turned it out for good, as you can now see. That would have rung harder. And we might even have thought it to be inappropriate for them to have said, right? That they would say something like that wouldn't have sat well with us. Now, why? Why is that? It is because in our humanity, we instinctively can realize that such depth of conviction cannot be derived from an ivory tower. That you cannot derive that just simply from an ivory tower. And so in other words, here's what it means. It means that you needed to have fallen on the victimized side of that evil and suffering and not on the perpetrating side. On the victimized side of that evil and suffering to actually deeply appreciate how God is redeeming it for his plans and his purposes. And so Joseph had to have endured the suffering that his brothers had inflicted upon him. And it was only as he endured it, lived through it, that he was able to grasp unique insight into what God was actually looking to accomplish in it all. And so verse 20 only has credibility. Depths of credibility because it's coming from the mouth of Joseph and not anyone else's over that situation. And so in fact, as our commentator Joyce Baldwin explains it, she writes, despite all the injustice he had suffered and the years of imprisonment, Joseph could see God's hand at work in the outcome of events. Over the years, Joseph had been molded 
by his observation of God's dealings with him, enabling him to endure hardship, resist temptation, and keep hopeful even when other people let him down. So overwhelming was Joseph's sense of God's loving kindness in taking the hatred and incorporating it into his wide purpose of blessing that Joseph was humbled. Joseph was humbled. Therefore, here's what it teaches us. Is this, the true insight into God's grace in our suffering comes from enduring it and not escaping it. It comes from enduring it and not escaping it. And so, friends, do not bypass your suffering. As difficult as it is to say and to even hear, do not bypass your suffering. Face it with humility and with a faith, asking God to be gracious to reveal both His presence, because you're needed, and His purpose in your pain as it evolves. Because true appreciation of the grace of God in our lives comes from persisting with it. Persisting with it. Now, as I've alluded earlier, that suffering, uh, suffering can be so overwhelming in our lives, right? Leave us feeling powerless in the face of it. And so it would only be natural that we would feel somewhat despondent in hearing that we have to endure rather than escape our suffering. That we have to endure rather than escape our suffering. It's a deeply discouraging. And yet Joseph's story, his story, offers us great courage and encouragement in it all. Because you have to consider this. Joseph persisted, endured 22 years. 22 years of harsh suffering or hardship. 22 years. And yet, those 22 years were only 20% of his 100-year life. Only 20% of that. And so, after the worst was done, after the seven years of famine had ended, Joseph was only 44 years old when the worst of their suffering was done. 44 years old. And so that means Joseph still had 66 years of his life left to live. 66 years. Most of which he lives in obscurity. We're never told about those 66 years in Genesis. And so the, the years that got him written into our Bibles were those 22 years. But the rest, the 66 years that came after those 22 years, we're never told about. Never told about what actually happened during those years of his life, uh, of his life. Lives it in obscurity, mundane perhaps, as both, uh, as, as, his, uh, as his or yours or my life would look like. He lives it in obscurity. And so then what is that telling us? It is telling us this. Had you met Joseph at age, let's say 24, whilst he was in prison? Friend, you would have never predicted his rise to become the second, most, uh, the second in power in all of Egypt. You would have never seen it, never been able to predict it. You would have never been able to predict his rough old age in seeing his great-grandchildren. You just never would have predicted it. And yet, the grace of God transformed his destiny and his legacy. <laughs> Transform his destiny and his legacy. And so then, what is it uh, 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 telling us, friends? It is saying that despite, despite 
Now, whether you and I would live to be 100 years old, 110 years old like Joseph or not, it is telling us that our current struggles, our current struggles, no matter how severe they may be, no matter how severe they may be, will prove momentary and temporary in light of the eternity that God awaits you in God. Momentary and temporary. That's what they will prove, they will prove to be. And the way in which we respond to God in our current struggles will determine our eternal joy. Our eternal joy. Despite those temporary, uh, temporary and momentary suffering, it will determine. And so then we're seeing this being revealed as we contemplate what actually had happened, transpired in the entirety of Joseph's life. We've simply been uh, uh, realizing that God's grace will turn your darkest moment into a blip on the radar of the eternity he has secured for you. Your life, your life is far from over. Despite what might be happening around, far from over. Always, it is always far from over in God's timeline. Because in that, God, in that timeline, God's grace will turn your darkest moment into a blip on the red of the eternity that he has secured for you. Maybe you may want to respond and object at me at this point and say, but you don't know what's going on in my life. The pain and suffering and difficulty that I'm currently undergoing. And so how can you say that with great confidence? Friend, I will say to you, don't judge my words. I'll take my words for it. But judge whether we can have confidence that this is what God will do through his own word. So look at what he says to us in Romans 8, from verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that in his Son, Christ, he, uh, Christ, in order that Christ might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Past tense. Glorified past tense in Christ. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect. It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died already. More than that, who was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who is doing what? Interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Verse 37, no. In all thing, uh, these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, no angels nor rulers, no things present, no things to come, no powers, no heart, no depth, no anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so, friends, here's the takeaway. The grace of God that envelops your life because of Christ Jesus. That grace that has enveloped your life because of Christ Jesus guarantees that your God will work all things together for your good in the fullness 
of the eternity that he has secured for you in Christ Jesus. Let me pray. Father, we thank you that this is not our artwork, but it is yours. I'm deeply just marvel that in the response of the Apostle Paul, we will go on to say in Romans 11, all the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of our God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been His counselor? The answer is nobody. Or who has given Him a gift that in turn He might be repaid? The answer is nobody. For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things, including the evil and suffering that will come our way. To him be glory. To you be glory. God, we thank you that in our brokenness, in our shame, in our guilt, in our pain, in our suffering, and even in the evil that is intended towards us or that we have intended ourselves, your grace will find us will envelop us in Christ Jesus and will secure for us an eternal place that we can't even begin to dream of. We thank you and we praise you for that in Christ Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen.